the only true and reliable account of the great prize fight for one hundred thousand dollars at seal rock point on sunday last between his excellency governor stanford and hon f f low governor-elect of california reported by samuel l clemens for the past month the sporting world has been in a state of feverish excitement on account of the grand prize fight set for last sunday between the two most distinguished citizens of california for a purse of one hundred thousand dollars the high social standing of the competitors their exalted position in the arena of politics together with the princely sum of money staked upon the issue of the combat all conspired to render the proposed prize fight a subject of extraordinary importance and to give it an eclat never before vouchsafed to such a circumstance since the world began additional lustre was shed upon the coming contest by the lofty character of the seconds or bottle holders chosen by the two champions these being no other than judge field on the part of governor low associate justice of the supreme court of the united states and hon william m stewart commonly called bill stewart or bully ragging bill stewart of the city of virginia the most popular as well as the most distinguished lawyer in nevada territory member of the constitutional convention and future u s senator for the state of washoe as i hope and believe on the part of governor stanford principals and seconds together it is fair to presume that such an array of talent was never entered for a combat of this description upon any previous occasion stuart and field had their men in constant training at the mission during the six weeks preceding the contest and such was the interest taken in the matter that thousands visited that sacred locality daily to pick up such morsels of information as they might concerning the physical and scientific improvement being made by the gubernatorial acrobats the anxiety manifested by the populace was intense when it was learned that Stanford had smashed a barrel of flour to atoms with a single blow of his fist, the voice of the people was at his side. But when the news came that Lowe had caved in the head of a tubular boiler with one stroke of his powerful molly, which term is in strict accordance with the language of the ring, the tide of opinion changed again these changes were frequent and they kept the minds of the public in such a state of continual vibration that i fear the habit thus acquired is confirmed and that they will never more cease to oscillate the fight was to take place last sunday morning at ten o'clock by nine every wheeled vehicle and every species of animal capable of bearing burthens were in active service and the avenues leading to the seal rock swarmed with them in mighty processions whose numbers no man might hope to estimate i determined to be upon the ground at an early hour now i dislike to be exploded as it were out of my balmy slumbers by a sudden stormy assault upon my door and an imperative order to get up wherefore i requested one of the intelligent porters of the lick house to call at my palatial apartments and murmur gently through the keyhole the magic monosyllable hash that fetched me the urbane livery stable keeper furnished me with a solemn short-bodied long-legged animal a sort of animated counting-house stool as it were which he called a morgan horse he told me who the brute was sired by, and was proceeding to tell me who he was damned by, but I gave him to understand that I was competent to damn the horse myself, and should probably do it very effectually before I got to the battleground. I mentioned to him, however, that I was not proposing to attend a funeral. It was hardly necessary to furnish me an animal gifted with such oppressive solemnity of bearing as distinguished his Morgan." He said in reply that Morgan was only pensive when in the stable, but that on the road I would find him one of the liveliest horses in the world. He enunciated the truth. The brute bucked with me from the foot of Montgomery Street to the Occidental Hotel. The laughter which he provoked from the crowds of citizens along the sidewalks he took for applause, and honestly made every effort in his power to deserve it, regardless of consequences. He was very playful, but so suddenly were the creations of his fancy conceived and executed, and so much ground did he take up with them, 
that it was safest to behold them from a distance. In the self-same moment of time, he shot his heels through the side of a street car and then backed himself into Barry and Patton's and sat down on the free lunch table. Such was the length of this Morgan's legs. Between the Occidental and the Lick House, having become thoroughly interested in his work, he planned and carried out a series of the most extraordinary maneuvers ever suggested by the brain of any horse. He arched his neck and went tripping daintily across the street sideways, rearing up on his hind legs occasionally, in a very disagreeable way, and looking into the second-story windows. He finally waltzed into the large ice-cream saloon opposite the Lick House, and— but the memory of that perilous voyage hath caused me to digress from the proper subject of this paper, which is the great prize-fight between Governors Lowe and Stanford. I will resume. After an infinitude of fearful adventures, the history of which would fill many columns of this newspaper, I finally arrived at the Seal Rock Point at a quarter to ten two hours and a half out from San Francisco, and not less gratified than surprised that I ever got there at all, and anchored my noble Morgan to a boulder on the hillside. I had to swath his head in blankets also, because, while my back was turned for a single moment, he developed another atrocious trait of his most remarkable character. He tried to eat little Augustus Maltravers Jackson, the humble but interesting offspring of Honorable J. Belvedere Jackson, a wealthy barber from San Jose. It would have been a comfort to me to leave the infant to his fate, but I did not feel able to pay for him. When I reached the battleground, the great champions were already stripped and prepared for the mill. Both were in splendid condition, and displayed a redundancy of muscle about the breast and arms, which was delightful to the eye of the sportive connoisseur. They were well matched. Adepts said that Stanford's heft and tall stature were fairly offset by Lowe's superior litheness and activity. From their heads to the Union colors around their waists, their costumes were similar to that of the Greek slave. From thence down they were clad in flesh-colored tights and grenadier boots. The ring was formed upon the beautiful level sandy beach above the cliff-house, and within twenty paces of the snowy surf of the broad Pacific Ocean, which was spotted here and there with monstrous sea-lions attracted shoreward by curiosity concerning the vast multitude of people collected in the vicinity. At five minutes past ten, Brigadier General Wright, the referee, notified the seconds to bring their men up to the scratch. They did so, amid the shouts of the populace, the noise whereof rose high above the roar of the sea. First round. The pugilists advanced to the center of the ring, shook hands, retired to their respective corners, and at the call of the timekeeper came forward and went at it. Lowe dashed out handsomely with his left, and gave Stanford a paster in the eye, and at the same moment his adversary mashed him in the ear. These singular phrases are entirely proper, Mr. Editor. I find them in the copy of Bell's Life in London, now lying before me. After some beautiful sparring, both parties went down. That is to say, they went down to the bottle-holders, Stuart and Field, and took a drink. Second round, Stanford launched out a well-intended plunger, but Lowe parried it admirably and instantly busted him in the snoot, cries of, Bully for the Marysville infant! After some lively fibbing, both of them are used to it in political life, the combatants went to grass. See Bell's life. Third round, both came up panting considerably. Lowe let go a terrific sidewinder, but Stanford stopped it handsomely and replied with an earthquake on Lowe's breadbasket. Enthusiastic shouts of socket to him, my Sacramento pet! More fibbing, both down. Fourth round. The men advanced and sparred warily for a few moments, when Stanford exposed his cocoanut an instant, and Lowe struck out from the shoulder and split him in the mug cries of bully for the fat boy fifth round 
Stanford came up looking wicked, and let drive a heavy blow with his labored flipper, which caved in the side of his adversary's head. Exclamations of, Hi! At him again, old Rusty! From this time until the end of the conflict there was nothing regular in the proceedings. The two champions got furiously angry, and used up each other thus. No sooner did Lowe realize that the side of his head was crushed in like a dent in a plug hat than he went after Stanford in the most desperate manner. With one blow of his fist he mashed his nose so far into his face that a cavity was left in its place, the size and shape of an ordinary soup bowl. It is scarcely necessary to mention that in making room for so much nose, Governor Stanford's eyes were crowded to such a degree as to cause them to bug out like a grasshopper's. His face was so altered that he scarcely looked like himself at all. I never saw such a murderous expression as Stanford's countenance now assumed. You see, he was so concentrated, it had such a small number of features to spread around over. He let fly one of his battering rams and caved in the other side of Lowe's head. Ah, me, the latter was a ghastly sight to contemplate after that. One of the boys said it looked like a beet which somebody had trod on. Lowe was grit, though. He dashed out with his right and stove Stanford's chin clear back even with his ears. Oh, what a horrible sight he was, gasping and reaching after his tobacco which was away back among his under-jaw teeth. Stanford was unsettled for a while, but he soon rallied, and watching his chance aimed a tremendous blow at his favorite mark, which crushed in the rear of Governor Lowe's head in such a way that the crown thereof projected over his spinal column like a shed. He came up to the scratch like a man, though, and sent one of his ponderous fists crashing through his opponent's ribs, and in among his vitals, and instantly afterwards he hauled out poor Stanford's left lung and smacked him in the face with it. If I ever saw an angry man in my life, it was Leland Stanford. He fairly raved. He jumped at his old specialty, Governor Lowe's head. He tore it loose from his body and knocked him down with it. Sensation in the crowd. Staggered by his extraordinary exertion, Governor Stanford reeled, and before he could recover himself, the headless but indomitable Lowe sprang forward, pulled one of his legs out by the roots, and dealt him a smashing paster over the eye with the end of it. The ever-watchful Bill Stewart sallied out to the assistance of his crippled principal with a pair of crutches, and the battle went on again as fiercely as ever. At this stage of the game the battleground was strewn with a sufficiency of human remains to furnish material for the construction of three or four men of ordinary size, and good sound brains enough to stock a whole country like the one I came from in the noble old state of Missouri. And so died were the combatants in their own gore that they looked like shapeless, mutilated, red-shirted firemen. The moment a chance offered— Low grabbed Stanford by the hair of his head, swung him thrice round and round in the air like a lasso, and then slammed him on the ground with such mighty force that he quivered all over and squirmed painfully like a worm. And behold, his body and such of his limbs as he had left shortly assumed a swollen aspect like unto those of a rag-doll baby stuffed with sawdust. He rallied again, however, and the two desperadoes clinched and never let up until they had minced each other into such insignificant odds and ends that neither was able to distinguish his own remnants from those of his antagonist. It was awful. Bill Stewart and Judge Field issued from their corners and gazed upon the sanguinary reminiscences in silence during several minutes. At the end of that time, having failed to discover that either champion had got the best of the fight, they threw up their sponges simultaneously, and General Wright proclaimed in a loud voice that the battle was drawn. May my ears never again be rent asunder with a burst of sound similar to that which greeted this announcement from the multitudes. Amen. By order of General Wright, baskets were procured, 
and Bill Stewart and Judge Field proceeded to gather up the fragments of their late principles, while I gathered up my notes and went after my infernal horse, who had slipped his blankets and was foraging among the neighboring children. I... P.S. Messrs. Editors, I have been the victim of an infamous hoax. I have been imposed upon by that ponderous miscreant, Mr. Frank Lawler of the Lick House. I left my room a moment ago, and the first man I met on the stairs was Governor Stanford, alive and well, and as free from mutilation as you or I. I was speechless. Before I reached the street, I actually met Governor Lowe also, with his own head on his own shoulders, his limbs intact, his inner mechanism in its proper place, and his cheeks blooming with gorgeous robustitude. I was amazed. But a word of explanation from him convinced me that I had been swindled by Mr. Lawler with a detailed account of a fight which had never occurred, and was never likely to occur. That I had believed him so implicitly as to sit down and write it out, as other reporters have done before me, in language calculated to deceive the public into the conviction that I was present at it myself, and to embellish it with a string of falsehoods intended to render that deception as plausible as possible. I ruminated upon my singular position for many minutes, arrived at no conclusion, that is to say, no satisfactory conclusion, except that Lawler was an accomplished knave and I was a consummate ass. I had suspected the first before, though, and had been acquainted with the latter fact for nearly a quarter of a century. In conclusion, permit me to apologize in the most abject manner to the present Governor of California, to Honorable Mr. Lowe, the Governor-elect, to Judge Field, and to Honorable William M. Stewart, for the great wrong which my natural imbecility has impelled me to do them in penning and publishing the foregoing sanguinary absurdity. If it were to do over again, I really don't know that I would do it. It is not possible for me to say how I ever managed to believe that refined and educated gentlemen like these could stoop to engage in the loathsome and degrading pastime of prize-fighting. It was just Lawler's work, you understand." the lubberly swelled-up effigy of a nine days drowned man. But I shall get even with him for this. The only excuse he offers is that he got the story from John B. Winters, and thought, of course, it must be just so, as if a future congressman for the state of Washoe could by any possibility tell the truth. Do you know that if either of these miserable scoundrels were to cross my path while I am in this mood, I would scalp him in a minute. That's me. That's my style. 